the title of the book intrigued me. We've all heard of kamikaze, the fact that Japanese pilots flying Japanese planes would crash into your ship and try to sink it. But why on earth would you go hunting it? That was a puzzle which was revealed very early in the book because this is a book about a man who was hunting English pilots flying American aeroplanes of English ships that were attacked by kamikaze pilots. The author of the book was Will Iredale. Will Iredale joined the Sunday Times in 1999, but was the Sunday Times of London. He was working first on foreign affairs and subsequently on home news service. As a staff reporter, he specialised in dissecting news and undercover investigations. So that means he was working in London when he was able to check what the book deals about with the final operations of the British Pacific Fleet and the American Third Fleet against Japan between July and August 1945. And the genesis of Idell's book was the chance meeting in Kent with the former Royal Navy fighter pilot Keith Quilter. Will Iredale later met with other Royal Navy flyers, flyers who had flown on British ships and suffered attacks by kamikaze pilots and survived. Ken Ward, George Hinkins, Roy Belden, Val Bennett, Chris Cartledge and Wally Stradwick. So the book covers many people's successful lives. And their, their histories are covered in the book. But uh, my presentation is dealing only with a man called Keith Quilter. Yeah. Keith Quilter was born in 1922. He constructed model planes. He was a student at the De Havilland Technical College in Hatfield. He became one of the British pilots who flew the American planes off British warships and uh, his early training uh, was in England. He learned to fly fighter machines uh, but for his training he was taken to America where he practiced wartime landings uh, on land. Uh, that was quite uh, demanding. During his time there he uh, met a lass. You can see they were both very young. She was the daughter of a family in the state of New York where uh, the uh, trainee pilots were welcomed uh, to, during their training. And uh, they both fell into step. In fact, they became really involved in a wartime romance. And uh, when asked her father uh, if they could marry, he sadly declined because he realised that uh, Quilter was about to become a fighter pilot and not only a fighter pilot, he was going to fly from aircraft carriers. His uh, life was uh, a, a gamble. And also he was from England and uh, uh, that uh, also influenced his negative. Training was completed. Here he is uh, on an aircraft at the completion of his training. The Royal Navy, after VE Day, was essentially, by the press, forgotten. It was after European operation over five years uh, when VE Day arrived. And the total of people killed during those five years was 60 million. So that it was small wonder 
that these celebrations were wanting to erase all memory of uh, wartime and war activities. But the British Chiefs of Staff and Winston Churchill believed that a British strike fleet alongside the US Navy would be recognized after the conflict as a contribution to the defeat of Japan. In 1944, Churchill cabled Roosevelt uh, saying that uh, a British fleet would be happy to take part in the main operations against Japan under the United States Supreme Command. And the British Pacific Fleet was quite significant. It was the largest airborne strike force the Royal Navy had ever assembled. It had more than 250 aircraft, over 10,000 sailors and aircraft, and the majority of the airmen were volunteers. The American dominance uh, was evident in the aircraft because three quarters of the Royal Navy flew aircraft leased to the Royal Navy. Under a 1942 deal with the United States government, the US government supplied American aircraft to the fleet air arm under Lend-Lease arrangements. And the most effective aircraft was the chance board Corsair. It was a very powerful machine, a double row, double wasp, 2,000 horsepower, 18 cylinder engine. It had the largest three blade propeller ever used in a fighter. The diameter of the propeller was 13 feet, 12 feet greater than that of a Spitfire. But still the British contribution to the war in Japan was dwarfed by the US fleet, which was more than four times its size. And the, the procedures during landing on the carrier were that every landing was a personal triumph. The Spitfire was a formidable fighter in the air and based on the land, but the sea fire undercarriage couldn't cope with the deck landing. Quite often, when the landing gear failed, the aircraft had to be uh, bundled aside so that it didn't impede uh, future activities on the same carrier. The Corsair had bent wings and a very large propeller, again, diameter 13 feet. This shows one uh, coming into land, and you see how the designers solved the problem by bending the wings such that the uh, landing gear was quite short and very robust. But more relevantly, so that the 13 foot diameter propeller could clear the cables uh, stretched across the uh, carrier. This shows Quilter uh, on the deck with uh, his uh, mechanics. And you can see the uh, diameter of the propeller. Admiral King, the CNC of the US fleet, objected to the British involvement in the Pacific. Admiral Bull Halsey, commander of the US Third Fleet, welcomed it. So uh, there was mixed reaction to the American commanders for Royal Navy's involvement. In June 1942, at Midway, dive bombers from the USS Enterprise and the Hornet and Yorktown sank the Japanese carriers Akagi, Suryu and Kaga. The Royal Navy flyers formed their individual squadron, 1842, and this shows them lined up. Again you can see the large diameter of the uh, Corsair. And then they are stowed on the, uh, the carrier. I think that was the illustrious. There's Corsairs lined up, ready for takeoff uh, on a British carrier. And if you look very closely, you can see the round L, uh, the round markings of uh, a, a British aircraft of the time. And uh, there's the uh, a shot of the size of the crew of the fleet. 
the uh, British pilots carried the US chits in case of landing in occupied territory. Uh, they were in multiple language requesting the reader to take the bearer to the nearest Allied military post and expect a reward. There it is, and uh, three languages uh, at the bottom. Uh, this is uh, the first of two significant uh, activities as far as the, the nation of Australia was concerned. In early 1945, Admiral Bruce Fraser hand-based the British Pacific Fleet from Trincomalee in Sri Lanka to Sydney. Uh, you might remember I've spoken earlier about the Japanese attacks on the uh, British Pacific Fleet. Not long after Pearl Harbor, uh, the same fleet, the Japanese fleet, attempted to attack the British Pacific Fleet, but mercifully, fortunately, advantagely, the aircraft carriers were away on uh, activities and they survived. Aircraft carriers, indefatigable, formidable, victorious, illustrious, and indomitable, came to Sydney. In June 1944 was the Battle of the Philippine Sea. It was known also as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. Japan lost over 600 aircraft, three carriers were sunk, and more than 400 airmen died. Quite a significant loss. So that with depleted air power, Japan resorted to kamikaze attacks. And this coming photograph shows a kamikaze zero uh, just seconds before it crashed into the flight deck of Formidable, killing eight men and injuring 47. From July to August 1945, attacks were made on mainland Japan to Kunta. He wrote, the Japanese of the town and the bay of Awas ran to the nearest shelter. It was only as he reached the open sea that Kulta realized the attack hadn't gone quite as smoothly as he'd hoped. Sterling had ditched in Awazi Bay after his aircraft was hit by intense anti-aircraft fire and was now scrambling into his dinghy under fire from some Japanese who were taking pot shots at him from a few hundred feet away on the Japanese shore. One of the guys called up and said Ian had ditched after being hit by anti-aircraft fire, said Quilter, who now needed to check on Sterling's position, but he couldn't risk flying back over the town. As we came down for the attack, I had spotted out of the corner of my eye a side creek. So I stayed down at sea level and went around using the creek to approach the bay from the side without being seen. Quilter barreled his Corsair up along the coast before cutting in again and flying low and fast down the creek back towards the main bay. Breathing quickly for his oxygen mask, his eyes narrowed, and flicked all around the sky, keeping an outlook for flak or enemy fighters. But there seemed to be nothing more than wooden hills above him and the odd trawler below. Then, without warning, his engine cut out. There must have been an AA battery among the trawlers or fishing boats, as it's just stopped dead, said Calder. Too low to bail out, he had no other option to, to ditch. In a matter of seconds, he needed to make a series of decisions which would either save his life or kill him. With the water rapidly approaching, he yanked the lever to release the spare fuel tank, closed the throttle and gently pulled the stick back for what should have been a three-point landing. Bracing himself, locking his arms against the side of the canopy, as his course there dived down into the bay a mile from the harbour which he had just attacked. Quilter was making little headway and knew it was only a matter of time before the Japanese sent out a boat 
but was determined to keep paddling until he was picked up. Perhaps the Corsairs above would keep them off for a while. Just when he thought things couldn't get any worse, looking out towards the mouth of the bay, Coulter saw a black, sinister-looking thing appear on the horizon. Quote, I assumed it was a Japanese sub which used this harbour and was coming back into port. End quote. He immediately chucked his revolver over the side of the boat. Survival was about capitulation, not conflict. I just thought, oh God, I'm now for it. What could I do? As the black shape got closer, he saw figures. And then he recognised the white hats and uniforms. There was no mistake. They were US Navy gobs, ordinary seamen. I could see they were Yanks and I just thought, thank God for that. It's an American submarine. It was huge. The men hoarded Quilter up on board, who introduced himself. We've got ourselves a damn limey, was their first reaction. I then said, well, my mates are just a little bit further up in the bay, so if you don't mind getting him too, Quilter was sent below while the, the submarine scabbard fish headed further into Owasi Bay to pick up Sterling before it motored out at flank speed into the safety of the Pacific Ocean. The American Corsair pilots of Scabbard's Fitch Combat Aircraft Patrol received permission from Gunn to attack the frigate, to scoring two more direct hits. Down below, Sterling and Quilter were given shots of whiskey by the captain and issued with American Navy trousers and shirts and socks and boots. Quote, I had a fresh water shower. It was wonderful after weeks of salt water on the form, he said Quilter. For him and Sterling, the war was over. They would spend the next three weeks on the submarine and the Japanese surrendered before they were returned to their carrier. This is the second event that has relevance to uh, Western Australia or Australia uh, because the submarine scabbard fish was uh, similar to those who were based in Fremantle. Uh, you remember I've spoken before about the secret fleet in Fremantle and uh, the US submarines and many of them operating from Fremantle found their way uh, in service to the mainland of uh, uh, Japan. He took him aboard and the Japanese surrendered before he could leave the submarine. VJ Day had come and Coulter was sent to Sydney. This is a much later photograph of Coulter still alive at that time of the writing of the book. Thank you.